Hello, welcome to Cafe Soko. My name's Dan Gold. I'm very honoured to welcome at the start of episode 301, yes, we're on to the third series of this, Matthew Gardner's with us once again, and we're talking well, a few things from cybersecurity with Internet of Things, uh, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and augmented reality. So I'm going to throw it over to uh, Matthew. From when we first met, we were talking about social media, content marketing. The world in the last few years has changed really significantly. Um, I think we've got to the point where technology has kind of is now leading us. Uh, Internet of Things has become a real thing. Let's start there. How do you think that that has changed in the last, say, year? Um, I'm not going to ask you to be a futurologist and tell us where it's going to go, but the importance of security with it has become a bigger and bigger issue. Absolutely. So, first of all, the term, excuse me, need a bit more power. That's better. Power to me. So um, <laughs> the time really, when you look at Tony Fidel from Nest, very long career at Apple, a uh, very good product designer, doesn't really like the term Internet of Things, recently discovered that, makes absolute sense. So he sees this as being a very seamless integration. He designed uh, Nest because he was looking for the perfect house. He realized that a lot of the equipment in houses, one of my favorite themes, equipment all around us, technological equipment, based upon standards from the 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, thermostat, timer, not very good. So he just sees uh, Internet of Things as being kind of integrated seamlessly into life, which is great, amazing. So your fridge telling you how much more milk you need, um, going all the way up to AI, your bank advisor, your robo advisor telling you you're better off having a credit card loan than an overdraft this month, uh, or you're better off saving and having a credit card to a certain amount of time dates and that can be dealt with, uh, something playing with your animals whilst you're out, some kind of magic, automatically controlled robotic device, uh, internet of things, what else would you do? Um, there's even a snore tracker at the moment where it's on iPhone, it's very primitive. Uh, big projects in Camden, London and until recently, perhaps even still now, uh, in uh, Istanbul with sensors all over Camden, sensors all over Istanbul to try and monitor traffic more efficiently. So one could go on at great length. However, many Internet of Things projects kind of set to revolutionize the way we live. Uh, problem is most of them run on Unix and the problem is Unix isn't secure. Uh, we have things called zero days. Do you know zero days? Yep. Yes, for anyone who doesn't, uh, flaws in code which are undiscovered, which we don't know about, which uh, developers constantly try to find, and so do hackers. Uh, once you have a problem, they're open. Uh, really, to sum up, the kind of biggest, highest profile zero day around the Internet of Things was in the Fiat Chrysler, which was driven into a ditch, had its wipers turned on, mm -hmm. radio turned off, um, you know, minor things. So just on that one, I mean, a lot of people go, well, Internet of Things and connectivity, we're not really worried about it because it's just ordering stuff on a fridge or controlling your home temperature. But but the Fiat Chrysler one, I think it was that people were able to hack the uh, other systems via logging into the wireless hotspot on the car through the entertainment system. And there was a vulnerability that people just didn't know about. Now, as the Internet uh, starts to reach out to more, let's say, traditional um, things that we do. Um, what are we? What are we doing to be able to protect us, humanity, and uh, making sure that things are as safe as they possibly can be? Well, surprisingly little at the moment. Uh, just put it simply, there's. I think there's about three times more the amount of code inside a car than there is inside the Hadron Collider. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> that's quite surprising. Right. <laughs> so, obviously, uh, the more complex things become, the more difficult they become to manage. The more extraneous they become, the longer they go on, the harder they are to control. So, uh, cars, obviously, have had software added to them. Hadron is one of the most sophisticated technological and, and physical kind of entities in the world, experiments in the world, that was designed code in mind. 
So now we have these big flaws. Are we getting to the point? I read an article last week where we're looking at cars actually as the perfect place where you build effectively the platform becomes the car, the operation becomes the car. And then uh, the disruptive model comes in that people come in and say, hey, we could do this piece of software better to deliver more efficiency, or we could do this to be able to to improve safety. Is 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 there are we getting towards an API world with cars? Are we getting towards the point where other people coming up with sometimes better ideas than the manufacturers are getting the ability to, to prove their worth? Absolutely. Uh, looking at APIs as well briefly, uh, the chief engineer, sorry, CIO, and Netflix is talking about how there are so many APIs in the world now, you can imagine how things would be even five years ago. The things like Twilio API for telephony uh, take out most of the code from text messages. So text messages are 140 lines, 140 characters. Uh, about 10 times that amount is the billing uh, kind of data for a text message. So Twilio gets rid of that. So APIs have arrived very quickly, been many, many advancements very, very quickly, which means that, yes, cars are being eaten by software. Uh, it's the cars are kind of being perfected in a way, engine management, suspension, that all works really well. But now in order to build a car, you have to be a software manufacturer and car makers are nowhere near software manufacturers, so they can't compete in their own market. So we're, really, we're in an interesting place as well, because where technological advancements come from opening up to a market and different people with different ideas coming together as a, effectively as this automotive tech community, uh, solving problems or making things more efficient is one thing, but then the vulnerabilities that come with that as well, and people with with malintent. Um, you know, we saw the WADA story recently, where um, you know data was uh, distributed from an alleged Russian hacker group, not affiliated apparently with the Russian government, um, and there's very little that can that seems that can be done. So. The concerns that I have over security are maybe concerns that other people that are, are, are not too experienced in this market have. And and it brings that question of, you know, why should we leave this to a small group of security experts where actually maybe that technology and that thinking behind people developing APIs and maybe open the market on the security side to get people working in a bigger, more collaborative way on security? Yeah, really, security isn't a bolt-on anymore. Perimeter fencing doesn't really work. You see that in banking as well. Once you're inside the perimeter, you can do what you like, which means if you already work for a bank, you can do many, many things. So really, you need much more nodal approach, nodal structure. But whilst car manufacturers are organized in this siloed, vertical way, where, as Julian Tett at the FT says, you eat what you kill, it's very hard to put anything at the center, certainly anything new. So interesting position where software manufacturers don't really need the existing car industry. They can make their own from the remnants of the, of the old one. Uh, so then they don't really have big interest in making code secure because they don't own the industry yet. They don't want to own that industry. Car manufacturers, on the other hand, very much head in the sand, very much uh, only dealing with problems when they occur, uh, not really savvy around this. So in the middle, we sit in our cars, which are manufactured by these people uh, who don't really have full commands and full grasp of these security implications. Terrible. Just, uh, and so, go on. So just, just moving on from there, and, and um, we, we, we see how uh, digitization of the world is, is cutting down a lot of human tasks and helping us firstly become more efficient in what we do with with time management and different tools like that. Um, does this mean that if we did put on our future hat and became a futurologist and the way that investors will be looking at this, where the, the uh, automata, autonomous vehicles are, are progressing, the uh, Uber project is going really quite well. They've got their approvals and they're doing live trials and rolling out in the public space. Um, and we've, we've seen the uh, issues that, um, that Tesla have certainly had. But are we at the point where if we had, say, automated trucks, 
you know, all lorries and they just, they're always going to do the same route in the same direction, do the same drop-offs. Firstly, my question is why doesn't a lot of that stuff go onto the rail system rather than on the road? Because rails will always go to the same place to drop off at the same time in the same way. Um, that seems a pretty solid system. But if we went to the autonomous truck and delivery systems, whether it's drone uh, in the air or, uh, you know, the pizza delivery drones that we've seen uh, projects of. Do we think that people's concerns about security and genuine concerns about security and the lack of interest and investment in it will effectively rob us of the opportunity of, of having these automated tools that could free us up to do other things? Probably not. It depends on how quickly the gap is plugged. But you do wonder what it will take for uh, there to be a serious amount of, of attention around this. How much ownership should tech companies have of this before they really begin to invest in it? Then they're researching it now. Uh, I'm sure they'll get it right. But, well, pretty certain they'll get it right. But it's just the interim period where nobody really owns the space. Um, to give you a very quick example, so now apparently Anyone with a Volkswagen, uh, I'm not talking about diesel here, but apparently anybody with that remote controller uh, can be skimmed. They can, the, the remote controller can be sniffed uh, for <laughs> it's 30, 30 pounds. Probably it's quite cheap now for anybody from outside of the UK. Um, yeah. but that's what I'm reading. I've spoken to an Uber driver before who has uh, had a client in Chelsea who had her Land Rover stolen, driven away because basically the uh, remote signal sniffed. So that's it. Um, I mean, that's a big, that's an open floor right now. And and that's interesting because we were back in, I think remotes for cars were really coming about 1990, 1992, around about that era. And they were analog uh, transmission. And we had people with, you know, converted scanners, picking up the code and just replicating it. Then after that, the industry got smart to it. And what they did was they started randomizing the codes being transmitted and received to be keyed in together so that they were on a similar cycle. And if they stepped out of cycle because you changed your battery, um, it required you to go effectively do a reset so they were back in cycle to stop the whole analog scanner thing. When they became a bit more technologically advanced, they added you know, a key to it, a, a digital cipher and a key. And it just, it just amazes me that um, no matter how quickly we go with security, there's always going to be this issue of someone's got to break it first and someone's got to find the vulnerability. And it's back to exactly what you said at the beginning. Um, I do want to move on. Yes. Um, when we were speaking initially about um, uh, episode 301, as we're on, we also spoke about the idea of talking about um, artificial intelligence and virtual reality and augmented reality. We're not going to have time for all of it. And I think we should leave um, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality for another day. But um, artificial intelligence um, is, a, is a really interesting space because there was the project not so long ago where an investment club was advised by AI mm -hmm. as against a human advisor and the AI performed better. Are we at the point where we're going to see masses of bankers losing their jobs? Uh, not yet because there's too much equity wrapped up in the system and also uh, machine learning is just that, it is learning. So I think it's perfected certain area around certainly robo advisory got a lot of traction involved in quite a few projects uh, around wealth management where there's plenty to spare if you like and there are decreasing margins so when you go on to more kind of commercial or even consumer transactions i think ai will have a lot to learn before it can actually get it right even when it gets it right we then have to look at the potential implications so uh, there's a very good system, quite a few good systems for scenario mapping for AI so it can learn. So you can replicate the financial crisis and have an AI learn inside of that, uh, which is very helpful, but quite incredible. There are many, many scenarios that you can fake and the AI will learn inside it. The interesting thing is it doesn't, the AI doesn't care whether it's real or not, it's just learning. 
So I think there's a lot of learning to be done. And there's also, even when everything is being fully learned, there is a capacity for catastrophe from an unknown entity, which unproven, untrusted entity, which is a computer or machine learning or an AI. So I can't envisage humans entrusting their global financial system to an AI when, which is learning from humans who have proven barely able to manage it at some point. As well. <laughs> Very true. Um, this brings me on to a slightly sidetrack before we, before we leave, because we're slightly short on time. Um, when we, when we look at artificial intelligence and the learning that we've seen through customer service, a lot of organizations that have very repetitive systems, i.e. Uh, you phone up, people go through a script, if this and that, and it's all gated. Are we going to see more automated systems coming online and learning and improving and just getting to that point where customer services systems, rather than be dial this, dial that, it'll be natural language processing. It'll be speaking back to us and it'll generally get us the right answer and then, and only then, it will direct us to a human being if, one, we're paying for it, because that seems to be a premium service, and, two, if it's really necessary. Yes. So far, bots give you what you want when you know what you want. If you don't know what you want, they find it very hard. They'll come, the bot will say to you, you know, I want something new, or I want a new bot, and the bot might come back and say, what's a bot, for example. Mm. Uh, so, again, a long way to go. And nothing really um, kind of that rivals the capacity of humans to parallel process yet. So it remains to be seen. At the moment, Google have released new chips for AI. Uh, the AI is defining what the chips need to be, and then the chips change. Then the AI, AI becomes more uh, sophisticated because it keeps making new chips for itself. We make them, but it tells them what to make. So there's still a long way to go, I think. At the moment, it's in vivo. And it could progress very rapidly. Uh, also, human acceptance is a big factor. So it could progress, it could be accepted, it could have some setbacks. There's geopolitical stress in the world as well. So uh, it could roll really quickly or it could stop. It's not a marble rolling down the hill at the moment. Yeah, no. Well, uh, Matthew, time has beaten us for today. I would like to continue this conversation again at another time because there's always things that I can learn from you and um, there's just so much cutting edge work being done there. Um, if people want to get in touch with you about uh, what you do on a day to day, how can they do that? Go to catchlondon.com, catchlondon.com or follow me on Twitter at M-A-T-W-G, Matt W G. Matthew, thank you so much, and we'll connect soon again. Pleasure. Speak to you Thank soon. Thank you.